Welcome, everybody, uh, to the ASU California Center and the home of the Sidney Poitier New American Film School. I want to welcome all of our faculty. I see many of you here. Um, you make the whole thing go, and all of our students that are here as well. I'm Stephen Tepper. I'm the dean of the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts, uh, which is the nation's largest design and arts college, uh, comprehensive, with 8,000 students this fall. Uh, it's made up of five schools, so we have this amazing film school that's uh, alongside and working with and collaborating with a school of arts, media, and engineering, uh, a school of art, a design school, a school of music, dance, and theater, and then we also have our ASU Art Museum, all part of this extraordinary creative city we call the Herberger Institute. So the film school is our newest school, and while our film program began about 17 years ago, and some of you were there for the beginning of the production degree at ASU, we didn't launch the school until the spring of 2020. And uh, about six months later, I found myself in the office with an alum, Michael Burns, who's vice chairman of Lionsgate. And I was seeking his advice about this new school, what it could be, what it should be. And he uh, looked up, uh, he's a busy man, and he's sort of like, why are you wasting my time? Why does the world need another film school? And I thought about that, uh, and I said, well, I don't believe anyone has ever truly built an egalitarian film school that's open to all and operating at the very highest levels of excellence. He said, I think you're right. Um, and if that's what your aim and ambition is, you really ought to name the school for Sidney Poitier. And the next day, Michael Burns made the introduction to Sydney's wife, uh, Joanna, and, uh, and I was on the phone with her and making my pitch for why this school ought to be the place we honor Poitiers' legacy. And she was cautious because uh, she didn't know much about Arizona State University. So she didn't know, for example, that we were number one in innovation for eight years in a row she didn't know that uh, over 20 years we had sort of evolved this incredibly technologically empowered university that serves all learners from all backgrounds with a charter that reads that we will not measure ourselves by how many students we can exclude every year, which is how other institutions try to improve their rankings, but instead we'll measure ourselves by who we include and how well they do. She didn't know that we had 15,000 ASU Starbucks baristas who were getting their education for free at ASU. She didn't know that we were now ranked fifth uh, in the country for research expenditures ahead of Caltech and Princeton and Mar Carnegie Mellon and Notre Dame. Um, she didn't know that we were the number one destination for uh, uh, US veterans. Um, and she didn't know that we had named our uh, prestigious law school, the Sandra Day O'Connor law school, the first law school in this country to name uh, their school after a woman. And she didn't know that we had named our highly ranked journalism school, the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism, for an icon and beloved newscaster. So I started seeing her processing um, that we have uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, Walter Cronkite, Sidney Poitier. Those are three American heroes. Those are three people who embody dignity and statesmanship and excellence at the highest levels. And so she called the family together and they discussed it. And next thing I know, I am working on a launch event to tell the world that we have named the film school for Sidney Poitier. And in February 2021, uh, we had that launch event in the middle of COVID. Um, but the event, once it was announced, uh, got one billion media impressions around the world because everybody loves Sidney Poitier uh, everywhere. Um, I think only maybe Michael Jordan would have better name recognition globally than Sidney Poitier. And then it took us a whole year to find the perfect person to lead that school as our founding director. And that person, probably never imagined two years ago that they would be leading the Sidney Poitier Film School, but now all of us, and I would say 
uh, Cheryl as well, um, could not imagine anybody else in this role. So Cheryl Boone Isaacs, who I will be bringing up here in just a second, is a longtime Hollywood insider. She's the sister of the publicist, legendary publicist, Ashley uh, Boone. Cheryl rose to pr prominence uh, in the industry, vice president of publicity at Paramount, and then president of um, theatrical marketing for New Line Cinema. She was four-time president of the Academy of Motion Pictures and did amazing work to open up the Academy to new members, to diversify its membership. She's unbelievably committed to inclusion. She has a global mindset. She, you can ask her about the time, times when she was a flight attendant for Pan Am. Um, and uh, she loves our students. She would walk across hot stones to make sure that our students have a chance to succeed in this world. Um, I'm going to share one last story before I call Cheryl up. Um, a couple weeks ago, I took a group of donors to our brand new film production uh, site in Mesa. We just opened a 120,000 square foot, $100 million building. Um, it's the second home of the Poitiers School. And uh, um, as part of that program, we invited one of our most recent graduates to screen her short film, uh, Nuria Ibarra. And her film was called La Hermana. And the film's about an older sister who gives up her quince años for her younger sister because their family couldn't afford to. And, uh, and on the evening of the quince años, her, her, her younger sister gives her a pair of um, uh, sparkling shoes that they had both coveted since they were little girls in the window of a local shop. Um, and that story just represents so much about who our students are, more than a third of them are first generation and their families sacrifice everything uh, so, that, so, that, uh, so that they can come to college. Um, so I left the screening room where this film was showing to, in a world-class theater, um, Atmo, Adobe uh, Atmos Theater. Um, and I walk out, and we have a group of students checking out cameras at our equipment checkout room. And before we opened this building, our equipment checkout room was like slightly larger than maybe my closet at home. Like it was a big closet. And now it's two stories high and half a football field long. And it's got everything. And the student comes out and he's just like, I mean, his face is just lit up. And he just looks at me and he says, I cannot believe that you built this for me. Thank you. Um, and so with the spirit of our students, which is why we're all here, I want to welcome up our amazing and uh, already beloved founding director, Cheryl Boone Isaacs. Thank you, Dean Tepper. And welcome, everyone. It's lovely to see you here today. I want to take one moment to show you something on why we are here and why there is the Poitiers School and why it matters so much. The world I knew was quite simple. I didn't know there was such a thing as electricity or that water could come into the house through a pipe. I never thought about what I looked like. I didn't know what a mirror was. When you grow up in a community where everything you know is powerful and good and it's black, there's no concept of race that defines Cindy Poitier. I left the Bahamas with this sense of myself. And from the time I got off the boat, America began to say to me, you're not who you think you are. I'm a black man in a white world. There was a habit in Hollywood of utilizing blacks in the most disrespectful ways. And I said, I cannot play that. I don't think Sidney ever played a subservient part. Never plucked his eyes, never ducked his head. They call me Mr. Tibbs. I'm a black man in a white world. I'm a black man in a white world. 
It was the first time I had seen a black man assert his power. I'm a giant, and I'm surrounded by ants. I wanted to marry Sidney Poitier. He was like, wow. Movie stars should be wow. Biggest box office draw, black man, 1967-68. And the whole country is spiraling around him. We're hanging together by a few cultural threads, and Sidney Poitier is one of those cultural threads. The winner is Sidney Poitier. It's not easy being the first when you have to represent the entire race. He had big shoulders. He was given big shoulders, but he had to carry a lot of weight. If there were equality of opportunity in this business, There'd be 15 Sidney Poitiers and 10 or 12 Belafontes, but there is not. the other way around. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Ah. He's going to put black people in positions where they can have a career behind the camera. He came to this earth to move it, to change it, to shake it. You think of yourself as a colored man. I think of myself as a man. That's the summary of him. I love him so much. My life has had more than a few wonderful, indescribable turns. And I have lived them. If you have not had a chance to watch the Sydney documentary, I really urge you to. It is, it's just wonderful. It is the reason why we are here, biggest reason why Dean Tepper was so vigilant about having this film school and why I am here. In that um, little trailer, there's a few things that Mr. Poitier says. One of them is, if there were equality of opportunity in this business, There'd be 15 Sidney Poitiers and 10 or 12 Belafontes, but there is not. He also references that careers behind the camera need to be open much more in the world of diversity, inclusion, and equality. And that is what we are all about. We are committed to bring forward young talent and educate them and prepare them for successful careers in the entertainment business. And the entertainment business can cross many different lines. It's not just theatrical, which we all love, don't we? And want to support forever, because what we are supporting are filmmakers in front of and behind the camera, and that is what is important. Also streaming, also cable, and even broadcast, as it still exists. And you all, go to the movies, right? You all go, and you sit there, and at the end of your two hours, and these days sometimes reaching three, but that's another question, um, at the end of it, then you're sitting through at least 10 minutes of names in positions that support the story, and we are all about supporting the story. And our goal at the Poitier Film School is to create as much opportunity for our students to participate in every single facet of the entertainment business, whether it's around production, as well as around the support team that supports production, which is a vast field. There is, we're at a, a, a time in our history where the story has really exploded um, I think maybe not since the printing press. Mr. Guggenheim? G Gutenberg, I'm sorry. Gutenberg. Oh. Um, it has really exploded. And whether or not you watch a story on your cell phone even, what, we're ha what we have now is the ability to have uh, our students of all ages be able to follow dreams, all of us, have sat around and said, we want to write a book, we want to write a story, we heard about a good story, and we're about teaching our students from that first idea, wherever it came from, whether it's a book, an idea, an article that they read. 
and explain to them the process that one goes through. We want them to know about the business as a whole, as well as whatever skill sets they wish to perfect. I have found in my years in the business that the most successful people are the ones who understand the business as a whole. So they might come in believing they wish to be a director because they really don't know much more about the entertainment business. And we will show them all the different areas. And they might move and switch. They might decide to go in a slightly other direction. They might wish to go into my field of expertise, I'm saying that, is um, marketing and distribution. Because marketing and distribution supports the story. If we don't have and understand that process, then the movie, in my words, is really a very expensive home movie. And that's not the business we're in, nor is it the business I believe our students wish to be in. We want them to be able to learn how to present their stories, how to be able and understand that this process is by far a collaborative adventure. No one, no one makes a movie, a television show, a documentary, an animated film without many, many people in support. You must all work together and that is our major goal. We want and are actively pursuing the advancement in more inclusion. Because I know for a fact, and I'm gonna bring someone out soon and we're gonna talk about this, that, and, and Dean Tepper, you did reference that many schools, whether film or not, but certainly film, has been about a select few. And there is nothing wrong with that. But we wish to be much more expansive. We want to open that door to many more students, again, of all ages, to pursue whatever their creative juices are leading them. And we are there with them from day one all the way through. We want them to learn right away what it means to create a cinematic experience from a static, flat story. How that creation is, is is um, not the easiest thing to do. I know many of you have probably read a book, then gone to see the movie and say, oh, it's nothing like the book. Because, right, how many of you have done that? And that's true because a, a book, you're able to read what is inside the character's mind, what they are thinking about doing, what they're doing, how they perceive it. Well, that you can't do that in a movie. So it's really an art form to be able to even bring that side of a story forward in order to be enjoyed by a multitude of people, whether it's you alone or whether you are in a uh, building with 1,000, 2,000 people. And also, the other important thing about storytelling is the emotion that it brings. And that is also not an easy feat. And I have found through my years of teaching how delighted and, and, and how the eyeballs light up as students recognize that they have um, made a short movie, uh, worked on it day and night with a whole group of folks, and then sit there and be able to experience other people enjoying their thought process, their creativity, and how great they feel about it. And you know what they all want to do next? Any students in the room, what do you want to do after you do that? Make another movie, right? That's, and that, now you're rolling, now you're on your way. And we want to be there to help you for every turn that you make. Even if, even if you're, you've graduated and you've moved on, hopefully we will give you, and we're, we're going to push for it, to give you enough information and, and skills in order to pivot, in order to be in this creative, wonderful, exciting business that we all love. So now, give me a moment. Um, I want to talk about what I call my partner in crime. Our deputy director and professor in practice, Peter Murrieta. Peter is a multi Emmy award winning writer, producer, known for award winning series like 
Netflix, Mr. Iglesias, and Disney's Wizards of Waverly Place, which notably launched the career of global superstar Selena Gomez. He currently has a first look deal with Universal and is developing an adaptation of the novel Blood and Gold, The Legend of Joaquin Murrieta, which he co-wrote with the novelist Jeffrey J. Marriott. Peter is now currently involved with several shows and productions such as Primo on Amazon Freebie, Field of Dreams, and Universal's First Look. Now I wanna make a point about Peter. I did not know Peter before I started interviewing, I guess, and in, in speaking with Dr. Tepper and President Crow. But I have to say, if I had designed a team, I would never have been as fortunate as I am right now of having Peter. Not only is he a terrific human being, but more importantly, maybe, is that he knows television. Every single stage of television. So what the Poitier School has now is Cheryl, who has spent many decades in the film business, and Peter Murrieta, who has spent much time, decades, in the, in the uh, television streaming business. And we think this is incredibly wonderful teaming because we've had, as we say in the industry, have our hands dirty, we're in there, we have had grown up through it all, and now we are both so excited and pleased to be able to pass on our knowledge, our understanding, and our love and passion for this business to the future generations of storytelling. So Peter, come on up. Do we have one over there? Oh, you want to sit? No, no, I think okay. we have, yeah. That was very lovely. Oh, I mean it, you know that. It was very lovely what you said, and I guess I'll start off by saying the, the Marietta family motto for generations, really, is to uh, lower the bar so that when you walk over it, everyone says, oh my, look what he did. So you've given me a higher bar to jump over today, and I will try to do my best. Um, so we're going to have a conversation a little bit about what we're doing, and I want to start off by asking you, um, what and why did you come to ASU? What's that story? Well, I didn't know much at all about ASU um, when I received an email um, from a, an executive recruiter. And, and to this day, I must say, I, I don't remember her saying the word Sidney Poitier to me at all. But, and maybe so, but in my mind, I don't remember that. But what I do remember, which was interesting afterwards, is I responded with, yes, I'd love to have a conversation with you. And I wasn't looking for work, necessarily. And even though I have taught, um, in many schools, starting at USC and a few others in Chapman, um, for about 20 years. And, uh, and then we had a subsequent conversation and the word Sidney Poitier. Well, that does perk your ears, at least mine. And I have had the luck of knowing Mr. Poitier for many decades, actually. And um, with my work with the Academy, we really got much closer. And um, I thought, well, I need to pay attention. At which point I had a meeting with Peter, with Dean Tepper and Vice Provost um, Tiffany Lopez. And I had said uh, to Stella, uh, yeah, I want to meet at least with the Dean and let me, let me hear what people have to say versus what you read. And it was a terrific meeting. And right there I knew I wanted to be a part of this group. So that started it, and then on to uh, the provost, uh, Nancy Gonzalez, and President Do you remember Crow. our first conversation? <laughs> Very first conversation, um, and I want to bring it up. I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, it speaks very specifically to what Cheryl talked about 
just moments ago in terms of jobs, right? So she comes from film. She was the president of the Academy. I'm a TV writer and a showrunner. It's a different show business. But my first job in LA, because I did construction in high school, was building sets for New Line Cinema. So I met her in the lobby here, and by the time I got up to the elevator, because she was the president of marketing at New Line, I said, oh, I worked for this woman, Carla, 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 and she finished it, Carla Fry. And I was like, yep. And that person was the person who looked out for me, who knew I wanted to be a writer and not just swing a hammer. And like when it was ready for me to go, she was ready for me to leave. And that's an example right there of all the jobs that are available, all the possibilities that are out there. So I just remember that. Well, that leads me to ask you, why you? And why are you at ASU? Yeah. Um, I, I've been thinking about that question, and uh, I've given different versions of that story before. And I know there's people in here who've heard them. So as a writer, I always try to think, what's the most interesting way I can tell that story to give the people that have heard it before a little pop? Um, and I guess I would say I want to just call out like three specific years and I'm going to tell you how I got here. And the first one is um, 2003. Um, in 2003, I had written on many different shows, and I had gotten my very first show that was mine on the air. And the name of the show is Greetings from Tucson, and it was about my life as a teenager growing up with this very difficult father um, in, in Tucson. And it was a biracial family, um, seven out of the eight regulars on the screen were uh, Mexican-Americans. And um, at that time, there was a show called Resurrection Boulevard that was on Showtime. It was a one-hour drama about a family of boxers in East L.A. And there was a stand-up comic, uh, Jackie Guerra, who had a sitcom on. And George Lopez's show was about to come on. And there was this real feeling in 2002, 2003 of this is about to happen. Like, We've been waiting, we've been gathering strength and speed, and we're about to, to do it. And then all those shows went away except for George's, and George's lasted maybe two or three more years, and then that was it for a while. And then another wave happened, and then it went away. And at some point, it occurred to me that while we're attacking the business for representation in one way, there's got to be another way. And then the next year would probably be 2018, which is when I met uh, the dean and vice provost, Tiffany Lopez, and Jason Scott, who you'll hear about in a second or two. And um, they approached me, and they really started, I, I wouldn't say a hard sell, but they were like, you're a native Arizona, and you have succeeded in your lane in show business. You need to come stand in front of our students. And I was like, Phoenix? I'm from Tucson, man. I don't know. <laughs> right? And they kept after me. And they said, well, we've got big plans. At the time, the, the, the film program was inside another school. And they quietly told me, that's not for long. Just you wait. And they quietly told me there was plans for a building that was going to be um, pretty substantial. Um, and then they said, there's another building coming in LA. Just you wait. And I don't know. I took a flyer with them. And everything they said happened, which is pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. And, uh, and then the last thing is, um, I, I feel when I'm in front of students, um, that I get so much out of them that I almost don't want to tell them that. <laughs> I almost don't want to say, like, hey, you're feeding me way more than I'm feeding you. Um, but it really does keep me centered. It keeps me uh, aware of what I want to do and what I want to do in the world. And it also feeds all the way back to 2002, which is, like, this idea that if we're not going to be able to take over Hollywood in this other way, well, that's fine. Then I'll go somewhere and I'll just create an army to keep coming, like hundreds and hundreds, coming, coming, coming. 
So that, along with um, my wife wanting me out of town once a week to fly somewhere else and bother some other people, those are the reasons. <laughs> and we're so happy you had those reasons. Um, but I think the two of us, uh, earlier in our lives, uh, you wanted to be a writer. Uh, I had no idea what I wanted to be. Um, I, I wanted to travel, uh, which is the reference to Pan American. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Uh, cause now so you people, do. You get to travel. Yeah, right. And those are the days. Now. Of, just yeah, one now I do. Yeah. $99 flight to well, that was Sky Harbor. <laughs> and I, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and... I wanted to be in the film business, uh, and as referenced, uh, um, had a brother uh, who was very, very successful in the film business. Um, he, at one point, even was co-head uh, of a, a 20th Century Fox, and um, was the, the pioneer and, um, and person who pulled together and the entire strategy for the marketing and distribution for the very first Star Wars movies uh, that moved the summer release of movies from July 4 to Memorial Day. And to me, he was my older big brother. He was smart. He was charismatic. There's no way in the world. Never crossed my mind. Never crossed my mind. And uh, so I, I did a few things, like I said, like traveling, which was at the forefront of my mind. Um, but because of him, I had, did have an opportunity to meet people in the industry. But again, I, you know, they were so smart, and worldly, and Cosmo, and all sorts of stuff. You know, you put up all these barriers in front of you on why you can't. And I was certainly one of those. Um, and then one day I thought, what am I doing? You know, really, truly, what am I doing? Uh, and took a little bit of time there of crying and thinking about, what do you want to do with your life? You can't keep... <laughs> doing nothing, just hanging out, right? Um, and, uh, but again, didn't know, uh, packed up the, the cats and the, and the plants <laughs> and moved from San Francisco knocking on doors. Um, and I took the first job that someone said yes, and that was it. Um, and what that shows, I think, between the two of us is there's probably, in both of us, a deep-seated reason to want to be part of something creative. But we didn't know enough in some ways of how to master that, how to work with that, how to grow with that. And that's part of what we talk about all the time with our students, and certainly prospective students, because we know they're not really aware of all that is in front of them. They need a little guidance to move us forward. Yeah, that's totally right, totally right. Um, you know, what do you feel like is, like if you were to say the two or three things that excites you the most about what's next um, for the school? And um, I've got a couple, I know you've got a couple, but I think it's really great to talk about that because um, ASU is certainly a place that um, moves at a speed and <laughs> You know, I was just in a meeting earlier today with someone, and they were like, is this really possible here? And you're like, yeah, it's totally possible. I mean, it involves a lot of work, but so much is possible here. So what are some couple of things you're excited about? Well, like I said, I didn't know much about ASU at all. And um, I had no idea of its breadth, its width, its power. Um, and most of all, its dedication. Its dedication to the education of Americans, as well as international students from around the world. Um, President Crow is beyond impressive. Uh, I, it's, it's just amazing. And working with Dean Tepper and being inside of this very unique, interesting space known as Haida, known as the Herberger Institute of Design and the Arts. That alone, I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. You know, they sort of moved us all together where our creativity can highlight across different schools. And as a suggestion, and, and a thought with that, is like the School of Music. You know, film has great composers and great songs, many of which we remember. 
And we will be bridging with the music school in order to teach our students who are interested in music and maybe hadn't thought about music and film and composing for film. The other, uh, certainly, Rodrigo talking about uh, the importance of sound design. Most young folks, they think, oh, I love music, I love sound, I'm gonna go in the music business, which is all great and wonderful. But we want to educate them to many careers inside of sound. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll say to you, know, what about sound? Well, I don't know, what is that? And, you know, you, what? Think about the sound, and this is my favorite character, of Chewbacca. Sure. I mean, where did that come from? And so, of course, I asked Ben Burt, where did it come from? And it actually is a baby um, bear that's hungry. Is it? Yeah. It In my is. world, he is <laughs> Chicano, because his name is Chewy. It's <laughs> and also, he travels around with his white buddy, and his white buddy um, understands Spanish, but doesn't speak it, which is why the movies are filled with him going like, I told you after the... I um, every time. I know. That's I know. My, in my world, that's, that's what it, it is. Maybe that's why I love him so much, because <laughs> uh, Chewie is the greatest thing. I mean, he's eight feet tall. He can shoot a rifle yep. and fly a spaceship. I mean, really, right? Yeah, he's like design. the coolest, greatest character ever. Um, but going back yeah. <laughs> is that we know, and, and, and part of us is we... we are in communication and we, uh, with community colleges. And yes. we are going to grow that area as much as we possibly can. Very excited about that. That's Very on my much, list. yes. You're yeah. going to talk a bit more because so much will be located in this building and in this city. Yeah, I'm very excited. That's one of the things I'm, I'm most energized by right now. And we had some meetings this morning about it. But to, to create a program where, um, you know, there are, there are not enough spots in California for the University of California uh, and Cal State uh, system to take the community college uh, graduates and give them the opportunity to pursue their bachelor's degree. And, and in an effort to create relationships with Cal State and the UC system and also community colleges, we are going to have a program here where you're going to be able to come finish your degree uh, in this building uh, and get a Bachelor of Arts in, in film from us. And um, it's very exciting. I was at a panel two days ago and met some co community college presidents and provosts and you know, just really the opportunity in this building to interface with people. When President Crow talks about, you know, why are we here? We're here to generate these ideas and these partnerships and that's the energy of this building. I mean, he said it several times this week, and it's just a real boots on the ground for me about that particular program, as well as our Semester in LA program, which um, is two semesters old now and um, about to get a new cohort for next semester that I think might be double what we have now, maybe. And um, it's just awesome to see and be around that feeling that things are happening. And, and the other thing that, that is on my list, and then I'm going to go back to what's on your list, is, you know, um, internships, right? You and I have talked a lot about that, and, and we're working with uh, Adam Collis uh, so closely on that program right now in L.A. That idea that uh, one of the community college's presidents said it yesterday. Uh, it's not enough anymore to take a student from a high school into a community college to try to um, pass the baton off to a, a four-year degree, um, you have to answer the question of how is this going to help me get a job? How is this going to help me? And so we are finding that for us, that's going to be measured by not just the education, but the opportunity to go have an internship. And we want that to be incredibly robust, and we want to have the ability to have our students um, get that wide range of experience so that they're ready for the workforce, because mm -hmm. that's the why. And also with our semester in Los Angeles, um, we have a class, Adam's, Adam Collis's class, called Welcome to Hollywood. Uh, and certainly for the students in Arizona who maybe have been to Los Angeles, but they haven't been to Hollywood. 
Uh, so uh, that class is comprised of meeting, interacting, and hearing from industry professionals, how they got started, what their road was. Because we've also found out that, you know, that dream, you think you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then there you, there you are. But we all know in life anyway, there's a lot of curves. There's a lot of situations that make you take a right when you thought you were gonna go left. And um, we like to show our students, and, and, and certainly have the industry professionals talk about the roadblocks they went through, the challenges they had, but at the end of the day, it's the determination, the passion you love for what you wish to do and learn about, that drives you and they become successful. That's right. And that's their own definition of successful, not so, someone else's. And that is only done with a group, a group of dedicated people that all share that vision and are galvanized by that vision and are moving towards that vision. And I think, um, you know, it's time for you to share with everyone else who those folks are. Well, I do want to mention um, a few things. Sure. Uh, the, the seal. Sure. The seal of excellence. Sure. Sure. You mean the HSI? Uh -huh. um, yeah. That, that um, I think just this last month, I'm looking at Dean Tepper, so he'll nod if I'm saying the truth, or he will go like this if I'm not. Um, I think that ASU um, received uh, the certification that it's a Hispanic-serving institution. And that means, I got the nod, and that means certain things uh, in terms of not only the student body representation, but the faculty representation, uh, among others. And I think we might be the largest um, university to uh, receive that, which probably is also true because of the size of our university. Um, I also checked with our staff, and our film school is also at that number, both in faculty and student representation. And I think that's an amazing achievement, that we are there already, and we will continue to be there. And I think we've also got, yes, thank you to everybody out there. And I think we've also started some discussions with some very specific partnerships and some corporate partners. Do you want to talk about well, that? Well, yes. Um, we've been in discussion and have partnerships with Avid and with Dolby Atmos. And we will continue to get more and more and more and more so that our students just start day one. Yeah. You know, getting used to this process. We've also uh, have a relationship, a partnership with the University of Guadalajara, which we're very, very excited about. And for me and my international love, you get to travel. Um, it's the first of many uh, <laughs> of, uh, of, of exporting our In another way, we're a good team. Because you love Absolutely. traveling, and I'd like to be home immediately. Yeah, it all works really, really well that way. <laughs> now, we want to talk about and show you our complete team. And let's see. Here is our leadership team, of course, me and Peter, with Sharon, uh, Sharon uh, Teo Gooding and Jason Davids Scott. And we move on to the rest our, of our faculty. faculty, our excellent faculty. We really want you to see them, see their faces and their names. Carla Bishop, Louisa Parvu, Joe Fortunato, Nita Bloom, Max Bernstein, Greg Bernstein, no although relation. not related. No relation. It's a very common name. Um, <laughs> Horacio Velasquez, Eliciana Nascimento, Chris Lamont, Crystal Griffith, Jonica Sedana, Philip Clusarius, Reina Higashitani, Nicholas Polarski, Rodrigo Morales, Adam Collis, Jean Gansel, Mary Matheson, Andres Torres, and Paul De Negres. Please give them all a round of applause. And some of them are in the room. Yeah, if Will they're you here. please stand up, those of you who are in the room? Come on, don't be shy. Sharon's there over there. Jonike, There's Jonike. Andres, I see uh, Adam, Adam in the back there. In the back there, um, great. We are so happy that you have joined us, and this 
This team of ours, of faculty and great staff, has helped us really move quite a bit in this, uh, now we're in the 10th month, really? 10th month. 10th month, my 10th <laughs> month. Um, and we're moving fast, we're gonna continue to move fast. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation. And uh, we're gonna move along. I'm gonna give uh, we're not finished. a round of applause for Cheryl Boone Isaac. Uh. Um, and have been appointed to serve here at the California Center. And I'm uh, beyond thrilled and excited about their presence, and I want them to meet you, and I want you to hear about what they're up to. Uh, the first one is Alex Rivera. Uh, Alex is a filmmaker whose work explores themes of globalization, migration, and technology. Um, his feature films, Sleep Dealer and The Infiltrators, both won awards at the Sundance Film Festival. Rivetta is a 2021 MacArthur Fellow, was the Rothschild Lecturer at Harvard University, and is currently an Associate Professor of Filmmaking Practice at ASU. I also had the pleasure of knowing Alex for maybe 15 years, and the idea that I get to come see Alex at work every day is tremendous. Uh, Christina Ibarra, is a 2021 MacArthur Fellow, a multiple Sundance award-winning filmmaker, and a first-generation Mexican-American. Over the past 20 years, Christina has developed a genre-bending, media-mixing, cinematic language inspired by her Spanglish, border-crossing Tex-Mex roots. Films such as The Last Conquistador, uh, Las Martas, and the infiltrators have introduced national audiences to a new, striking look at the U.S.-Mexico border and what that means. Um, let's give a round of applause and let's see them right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, thank you, ASU, for having us here. It's, it's really awesome to be here. Yes, and thank you to the entire team here at the California Center for bringing us together. We're really grateful to be able to have this chance to share a bit about our work and what we hope to build here at ASU. Um, so Alex is going to start us off. So uh, yeah, like, like Peter mentioned, I'm a filmmaker and a digital media artist who makes work focused on border issues and cross-border communities, including my family. I've been doing this work for about uh, 25 years. My films strive to be socially grounded but artistically elevated using genre and formal experiments to hopefully open the work up to new and broad audiences. So as one example, um, in 2008, I wrote and directed my first feature film. It's a science fiction thriller set on the US-Mexico border. Here's a bit of the trailer, and so we'll cue the video. We build your skyscrapers, and we harvest your crops. We even protect your property. Let our robotics do your dirty work. Safe, reliable, we make. His name is Nemo Cruz. At first, I didn't think much of him. Just another node worker, risking everything to connect to the other side. was one of millions. That's until I got a strange call. I will pay for any information on him. What's in his past? What is he hiding? Memo. 
tú no me conoces, pero yo a ti sí. Gotta watch it. <laughs> On my end, so I call myself a border filmmaker. I'm interested in these daily crossings, the rituals and the spectacles that make up the performance of identity in my homeland. So I, my films aspire to create these new entry points into what we might think of as the old border narrative. Um, and so, for example, I wanted to tell you about um, one of these films. I visited my cousin in Laredo, Texas, when everyone was preparing for the annual celebration to George Washington's birthday. I set out to uncover why this small border town, a place where Washington never stepped foot, is home to the largest Washington celebration in the country. And I pulled two excerpts for you from that film. You can play, play the, the scene. Like all great American cities, Laredo is a community blessed with family traditions and rich in history. Ladies and gentlemen, the first president of the United States, George Washington. The first lady of the land, Martha Dandridge Washington, portrayed by Betty Ann Bunn Moreno. We proudly boast our border heritage, and we take just as much pride in highlighting our American heritage. The Society of Martha Washington is pleased to introduce Alejandra Cecilia Howland. Why would a Mexicano community celebrate an Anglo uh, oppressor? I do think, strategically, it was very smart. Once these territories become part of the U.S., Anglos came wanting to dispossess people of their land, violently or otherwise. There was a lot of lynching in Texas. Squatters would come in, and then they would simply kill or claim the property. If you wanted to keep your land, you had to prove that you had eligibility for U.S. citizenship. And in order to be a citizen, you had to establish that you were white. But you look down from Washington and you see all of these Mexicans dressing up like George and Martha Washington, you're like, oh, they're okay. Laredo was fortunate in that the Anglos saw nothing there. You know, they saw an arid wasteland, which later became very rich in oil and minerals. Because the Mexican Tejanos are able to hold on to their land, a lot of them discover fortunes of oil and become uber wealthy. They're, you know, still some of the wealthiest families in the United States. So for 25 years, separately and together, we've been telling stories like this that aspire to reflect our community, to look to the borderlands as a home and a source of inspiration rather than a dividing line. And so we're joining the Sydney Poitier New American Film School because we see a deep alignment between ASU's mission of inclusion and the objectives we've been pursuing in our work. And specifically, we see a crisis that we think can be addressed in new and potentially exciting ways right here. So a bit about that crisis. Um, Latinos make up nearly 20% of the national population, 30% of the state of Arizona, over 50% of the city of Los Angeles. But in study after study, we under-index by extraordinary levels as lead creatives, writers, directors, producers in film and television. On the TV side, a recent study looked at showrunners, basically the head writers on network TV shows, and found less than 4% were Latinos. Directors, less than 3%. On the cable side, you'd think it couldn't be worse, but it is. Numbers near zero. And on the film side, re researchers found 4.2% of directors on studio films were Latino. And these numbers include filmmakers from Spain, Mexico, and Latin America. The actual number of US Latinos in the industry is even smaller. How is the situation changing over time? Personally, I feel like I've seen these same numbers for 20 years. 
but in fact, when viewed against the growing population, uh, the Latino population, um, participation of Latinos is actually going down. Yeah. And so this is an urgent issue of workforce equity and opportunity, and it's a crisis of representation, imagination, and power. The numbers are so entrenched and daunting, we see it as a cultural emergency. And so if we want a media ecosystem that includes and reflects all of us, how can we get there? How can we respond on a timeline and at a scale to match this extraordinary challenge? What roles can a visionary public university like ASU play? So it's clear that the work already happening at ASU, like the semester in LA, the internship program, and the film school's focus on inclusion and excellence will all, over time, create more representative leaders in film and TV. But in the context of this cultural emergency, we can and must affect immediate change. And we believe the fastest change can come directly from engaging with and supporting mid-career Latinx filmmakers. So, because we're part of a generation, really, of Latino filmmakers whose work has been celebrated critically, played at top film festivals, and some who've even made money. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, it happens uh, to a few of our friends. Um, but these independent filmmakers are precisely the people who've been denied pathways into the industry and denied opportunities to make second and third films. Yeah, one example of many is Patricia Cardoso, who directed Real Women Have Curves. She was shut out of Hollywood for 15 years. For 15 years, she was unable to make a follow-up film after the smash success of her first film. Ava DuVernay recently gave her a shot directing TV, and she's been directing nonstop. And so but we believe an innovative public university can address this situation by doing what universities always do in times of crisis, by bringing together leading minds, taking risks that commercial enterprises won't, creating new knowledge and pioneering new solutions. So we're coming to ASU to establish a first of its kind lab that aims to support, accelerate, and produce the work of visionary mid-career Latinx media makers alongside a teaching track focused on applied learning. The goal is to produce new cinematic works, actively address the crisis of underrepresentation, and connect those productions with students so they can learn by doing. We want students and our colleagues to succeed in whatever ways they dream of in a better, more just film industry, not 20 years from now, but today. The Borderlands Media Lab will develop, produce, distribute, and study moving image works inspired by the Borderlands. In the lab, we see the border as a mindset, a culture, a history, and a zone of urgent narrative possibilities. In many ways to us, it's synonymous for the Latino experience. So we've just started on this project. We're developing a plan, starting to raise funds, designing our first classes, working on a concept for programming and a slate of first films to support. Christina's already brought a documentary she's producing along with Frontline into ASU and is already involving students in that production. Working together, we believe we can address this cultural emergency and help empower the next generation so they don't face the same crisis they'll have different crises to deal with. That's <laughs> guaranteed, but hopefully not this one. So the field is wide open. We're so excited to do this work with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina and Alex. It was really informative, wasn't it? Really interesting. Shows what we're doing at the school. All right, now I'm going to introduce Nani de la Pena, our program director of the Narrative and Emerging Media Program. That is in conjunction with the Poitiers Film School and the Cronkite, Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Nani is a South by Southwest Hall of Fame inductee, and Fast Company named her one of the people who make 
the world more creative. And you'll see that. She has been on the cover of the Wall Street Journal magazine as a technology innovator of the year and has been called the godmother of virtual reality by Engadget, The Guardian, and many others. She is a New America Fellow, a Yale Pointer Media Fellow, and has a PhD from USC's School of Cinematic Arts. Please welcome Nani de la Pena. I'm always the complicated one. Let me just plug my computer in here. Sorry, y'all. Make sure that the audio is set. One second, sorry about this. Just checking the audio and then we'll be good to go. Yep, we're on now. And this clicker. Okie dokie. So, let me let, tell you a little bit more about myself. So, we blow what are on Adele Pena's awards, just like Christina and Alex, uh, MacArthur Genius, uh, Peabody, uh, the Peabody Award, and the Emmy Award. Um, no, those are a bit of lies. Those are lies told by OpenAI. A friend of mine was writing a book. He interviewed me for a chapter. He put that information through a translation program and, and was actually transcribing our interview. And it just made up stuff about me. I was a 22 Peabody Award uh, winner for building the field. But this continues. So at one point, we changed the conversation, right? And I'm, I just one of those people sometimes I can hop from things to thing. And the AI hated it. And in the middle of one of those hops, it just inserted all this stuff about how I went on a road trip because I was broke and then I had a benefit concert in a transcription of a nonfiction book, okay? Anyway, appears it gets bored and daydreams just like the rest of us. So a little bit more about where I really come from. Here's a trailer from some work that I did leading up to coming here. Be our pioneer, Noni de la Peña. What if I could present you a story that you remember with your entire body and not just with your mind? So what'd you think? Oh, you're crying. With VR, virtual reality, I can put you on seat in the middle of the story. You get this whole body sensation. There's a bunch of cops here. They're like standing around. Something's going on. Oh, right here. Ah, oh, that's not cool. On the other side of a fence, there's all these people just like kicking and beating. We can have what I call this duality of presence. A real feeling as if you were in the middle of something that you normally see on TV news. So I started applying all these ideas to what I've named immersive journalism. And we all know being there is the most important part of understanding almost anything that's happening. Along in a partnership with America's premier investigative documentary series, Frontline, who had incredible access on solitary confinement cells. What that is, is photogrammetry. And it's exact photographs of a cell. You are walking around the exact cell, the exact footprint. You are in the room. Works so well for putting people on scene at real stories. So then what? You gotta put the people in there. How do you do that? I can now put you in the room with somebody who is videotaped in volume. You can literally walk around them in a volumetric way. Okay, so Martha Gellhorn was a World War II reporter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and she called what we did in journalism, view for the ground, the view from the ground. So this was certainly the way that I tried to practice my journalism when I was a correspondent for Newsweek. I did this cover story where I hung out in a crack den for 24 hours and then tried to write about what it was like to be there. Um, and uh, as I started thinking about applying these ideas to virtual reality, uh, I wanted to tell the story about how people were invisible that were going to food banks. 
Uh, they were running, uh, this is during the down, the big, you know, the Great Recession, and, and food was disappearing. And so I felt it was really important that I could tell that story. Um, and this is what we ended up building based on audio from a real day where a man with diabetes waiting in a long line collapsed into a diabetic coma. And um, at that point, we didn't even have GoPro cameras, right? So we rebuilt everything with these kind of donated characters. Um, and this gives you some idea how we took those characters and then put uh, motion Cross onto them. Final 02 to no, 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 take four, mocap ready. This guy, John Brennan, had to play every single character, the women, the children, the food bank lady. I have to say, he's a genius. He's gone on to build all the virtual cameras for Steven Spielberg, uh, for Ready Player One, and for both The Lion King. But anyway, this is John and I in the middle of the night in a borrowed mocap trying to make this piece come together. That's the one that got into Sundance Film Festival in 2012. And at that time, we only had a headset called the Wide 5. This was this big monster, $50,000 a pair. I mean, we just bought a LiDAR camera for this uh, uh, building. It was $20,000, so I guess we're kind of there again. But anyway, when we got into Sundance, the head of the lab was like, you're not taking that anywhere. So we had to make headsets. Um, and we're fighting over there about where to put the lenses, because the dude who got his head in the mask, uh, he's got a big fat head and I have a skinny head. And those are the little black dots or your eyeballs, the IPD. We ended up going with something that looked like this. Uh, you can read the bottom of that, Palmer Lucky. Yes, I'm hat tipping something that's coming up in a second. But you saw, this is Gina Rodriguez. You saw in the opening video, it was actually her big debut at Sundance what'd you too, think? And how emotional the experience was. Uh, nine months later, the kid who built those goggles, who was crashed in my hotel room, started Oculus Rift, sold it for uh, two, uh, $3 billion to Facebook. Um, he wasn't even old enough to drink. Um, but here's what you do with uh, this kind of material, right? About like, how are we going to use mocap to make very important emotional stories? So this is a slightly later piece I did. 40% of homeless youth come from the LGBTQ community because they've been thrown out from their homes due to their sexual orientation. After I gave my talk at TED Women, the actress Sada Ramirez approached me and she really wanted to make this piece about homelessness in the LGBTQ community. In collaboration with the True Colors Fund, I was lucky enough to begin working with them on finding the right material to tell the story. We ended up using the audio of Daniel Pierce who was thrown up by his own family and he happened to record the terrible conversation that ensues. Oh, get off of me! What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? So by putting the audience in the middle of this physical moment, you know, using the motion capture, putting on digital characters, and then making it life-size so it happens all around you, it's so startling. Suddenly this thing you've heard, which is disturbing enough, um, and maybe you've watched videos of this type of scene, but if it's there and you feel physically vulnerable, you connect to Daniel and to what he's going through in a way that um, I don't think any other medium affords. It, it, it is a really significant and powerful moment to be there with Daniel when, when he's that vulnerable, when he's surrounded by people who hate him just for being who he is. So I use the term kinematic for the walk around versus cinematic where we've been shooting 360, like this was uh, a refugee camp, this was in the Sudan, uh, uh, caves of Sudan, where children were hiding out. Um, this was a piece I did with Lena Herzog on uh, languages going extinct or dying. Uh, and the audio, in fact, um, is all these different languages, you'll start to hear it. Um, uh, some of them, we don't even know what they're saying. They're all these voices whispering in the background. Um, this uh, ended up being playing at um, Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. It was the largest uh, synchronous 360 video showing. Um, and uh, more recently with uh, Mary Matheson, uh, who is now uh, lucky enough come here to be part of professor of practice, she was the lead on this series about 10 young women. And um, I was lucky enough to co-direct three of them. And with Erica Barraza. Whoa. And this is a trailer from one of them. The hardest lesson I've ever learned? I was eight years old. It was the lesson that we are going to lose people in our lives and that we don't have to get used to it, but to understand and accept it. When I lost my father, I was two months old. My mother had been arrested, so I lived with my stepfather. 
I was raised by him until I was eight years old. He was like a father to me. When my mom had been out of jail for a week, my stepfather was killed. The lesson is to accept that all of this is to make us stronger. So a little bit more about photogrammetry so you can understand what it is. If you look in the left-hand corner, that's click, 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 click of an image. And the horse or the statue is what uh, is stitched together by the algorithm. So it gives you volume just from a series of photographs. And I use this to help uh, uh, a piece that was, you know, to push to have a women's history museum on the mall in DC. I focus on this badass woman who was a newspaper editor um, and she had this printing press that was so good, she was asked to publish the first, the print, the very first official Declaration of Independence. Why was it official? Because it was the first time the dudes put their name on it, because it was treason, right, to have your name on it. And guess what? She put her name on the bottom. Mary Catherine Goddard signed the Declaration of Independence. She had never had her name on anything else in a full before. In any case, she was so badass that when she died, she freed her slave and left her all her money. Um, but we didn't have a budget to actually go to a revolutionary era printing press room. So we found a museum in Deerfield and we used photogrammetry in order to recreate the space where we could then put in those volumetric characters. Yeah. That volumetric characters we talk about in the trailer. This was Kenny. He was, uh, he was also um, uh, in one of that solitary cell and we brought him into our stage and filmed him talking about what it was like to go through solitary and then put him into that photogrammetry of the cell. I'm going to show you a quick when clip I of this. When I walked into my cell, I didn't realize that I would be spending five and a half years of my life in solitary confinement. I look fine, but I'm not. 18 years old, I was new to the system, never really been in trouble before. As an adult, the solitary confinement and the sensory deprivation, years of it drove a relatively sane young man insane. Cut myself thousands of times, just over and over and over and over. So I'm just going to stop there, but I want to show you also the other kind of performances we've captured. Um, this was Trombone Shorty being captured uh, here in L.A. at the Microsoft stage. I went down to the St. James Infirmary. It wasn't about being... And here he is in actual 3D model that you can walk around. You can see the level of quality that we can get now. Similarly, I put you in the middle of a sword fight, the soldier in there. When you see this young woman who is an Olympic fencer who battled this guy when she was 10 because there wasn't enough women, and then battled him again in college. And when I filmed them, they were actually engaged to get married. So I think this is probably the first volumetric kiss that was ever captured on a stage. Uh, so just going back to who's that person walking around who was inspired by this, that was Alejandro Gonzalez Inaritu. Um, that uh, helped him, oh, just to so you can see that if you look in the back, if you've seen his piece and you see that orange strip back there behind him, it's actually gravel, which he then incorporated into Carne Arena. I worked with him on that piece and that's why he kindly thanked me at the Oscars when he got the first Oscar for VR and then introduced my Peabody uh, Field Build Award, the real award that I got. Um, but just to talk about uh, a little bit more about how he and everyone else is moving over into virtual production. So what's virtual production? You're using game engine technologies to make those 3D environments, kind of like that prison cell or other things that I've made, and then you film people, real actors in front, and you can merge the two together. Uh, we actually have, I hope you'll see, our stage upstairs, our virtual production stage. It gives you an idea the facilities here are so good that we even have our own virtual production stage upstairs. And um, again, these are usually built by uh, game engine technologies, like Unreal, but more recently, Unity has bought Weta Digital, and these are the kind of digital characters they're starting to make. I use the same kind of technology working on how can you do fabrics that are digital that you can walk around. We worked with GCDS, a fashion show uh, company, and you can kind of see a little trailer of how the clothes are moving in digital space now. Or no clothes in her case. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now the fabrics moving like that just was awesome to be able to make. Um, then I want to talk about like now what are the future of experiencing VR? You're going to be using haptic vests, uh, haptic suits. We're going to be bringing some of these into the to the building here. Um, and just to give you an idea of how powerful it is to feel these things, uh, these are young kids who are using cystic fibrosis where they just vibrate their body to try to break stuff up. But these haptic vests are able to do it with music, with sound. And we intend to create here a whole lab dedicated to haptics for inclusion. How do we tell stories for haptics? How do the people who need uh, different kinds of experience tell their own stories? Um, everybody in their pocket has in their pocket now a LiDAR scanner that lets you capture things in 3D. And also we're going to be able to start using those same things in your pocket to capture humans instead of that huge stage like we did with Trombone Story. I'm going to be using this technology to give a talk from afar in uh, uh, Amsterdam. Um, and please know that AI is also, back to that, coming to virtual characters. So they're going to be driven, we're going to be scanned, and they're going to be driven by AI. How is that going to work? In a very rudimentary way, when my food bank lady is above the seizure guy, um, you would walk up to her and she would shout at you. I was using real audio and she would change what she did, um, but it was really um, uh, still a linear story, right? Full narrative, what happens still happens, just the moments change a little bit when you go up and get triggered by this, uh, when you go up and trigger her, go near her, because I had so much real audio. Objects are going to be also generated this way. You'll be able to say, you know, uh, I want a deer, I want an elephant. Uh, and the AI will actually give you 3D models so you don't have to build them yourself. And AI thinks you're going to be able to start doing screenwriting soon. So look around for screenwriting. I want to caution you about AI. This is something called mid-journey. And you can give it some words, and it'll do things like this. Hey, I want Donald Trump in space with an alien, hyper detailed. This is what you get back. But you got to be careful, because if you say, I want a you know, sexy woman, a happy child, white, 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 white faces. So know what you're dealing with. And I want you to understand AI can be destructive. Amazon even had to kill the recruitment tool because it was looking for words that women weren't putting on their resumes, like capture and execute. And they were only getting male applicants. I'm going to wrap up to tell you, all this seems kind of hard if you're new to it. But I've been building a no-code immersive tool set called Reach. Um, it will be a beta will be released in November, so please let me know if you're interested in checking it out. Um, and finally, I just want you to know that not only am I bringing a tool like that, but all of these things are being taught here in this new program, Narrative and Emerging Media. We have a graduate degree, and we're going to be having this research center, the Haptics Lab. We hope to do some policy and more cool events like this. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Nani. And thank you to everyone here today. I hope you've enjoyed our little presentation. I want to thank our staff. I want to thank our faculty. We are well on our way. ASU's Sydney Poitier Film School. Now, before you go, 
we do have guided tours. We'll have some of our staff over there near the door to take you on a tour of this gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous building full of a lot of fun toys to play with. And also, we invite you behind the curtain, our little refreshments, little cocktail reception. So please enjoy, please chitter chatter, go up to any of our professors, any of us, and have a wonderful conversation and a great rest of the day. Thanks so much. Thank you.